Um, for those of you that I haven't gotten a chance to meet with one-on-one -on -one and get to know in person a little bit yet, my name is Mariana. I am the Director of Faith Formation and Evangelization here at St. Malachi. It is my privilege and my honor to be here in general and then also especially with you today. I'm very excited about that. A couple of logistical things. If you've been here before, you know my spiel, but the spiel is if you are joining our CIA, you are going to get your very own super sparkly purple binder, which has the curriculum. <laughs> Hello, Father Danda, um, which has the curriculum for the year's program in it. Uh, if you are coming to the sessions, you can bring this and, and follow along depending on who's speaking that week. You may, uh, they may want you to look something up in the binder. But then other than that, there are two other resources we've given you. One is the Bible, the New Catholic Answer Bible. If you don't have one yet, it's on the table. And then also a catechism. Uh, it's a hefty book filled with the beautiful doctrines, the teachings of the Catholic Church. You don't need to bring those to each session. You can if you want to, by all means, get a workout, carry all the books. But if you don't want to, you don't have to. And also, for those of you who may be a little concerned, you don't have to read both books completely before the end of our CIA. Uh, if you want to, more power to you. You have my full support, but it is not required. <laughs> Father Danda, did you want yeah, to say hello? Inter Come inter on in. Interrupt, and maybe this is a great oh. opportunity. So uh, some of our, our friends here asked for some holy water, which you know is, uh, is a sacramental. We'll be talking more about that, that is used as a reminder of our baptism. And so a lot of times people will ask me, can I take some holy water home, you know, to, uh, to bless myself, to, to sprinkle in the, in the rooms, to just give us a sense of God's presence and his, his, his being and to ward off anything that's not good as well. That's always a good use for holy water. So I thought uh, as long as we're here, I, we can all pray together as I bless this water, all right? So these are very good bottle. In any sort of bottle you can kind of use as long as you're distinguishing it for that use. So this is a good, these are good bottles right here. Let us pray. Almighty God, you give us sacred signs and symbols of our faith. By the use of water, may we be drawn ever closer to our salvation in Christ who by the waters of the great flood led Israel out of slavery into new life and who baptized in the Jordan have given us the sign of our salvation. I bless this water that it may be a reminder of our connection to the good God to ward off evil and to draw us into the life of grace. I bless this water, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Simple as that. All right, and back to Mariana. Thank you so much, Father. Father's great. He just comes in and he does these little surprise, like bonus material. Like we just get this special water. Um, holy water is wonderful. Like he said, it has multiple purposes, and um, one of which is that because it's blessed. This we're gonna get into all the details of this later. So if you're sitting there like Catholics are so weird with the water and the blessings and the priest, and we are gonna get into all of it, I promise. But one of the beautiful things about the Catholic faith is that we believe that our God works miracles and that he's present to us and that his grace is bigger than the things that we can see just with our eyes in the natural world. And so Father has this authority through his priesthood in the Catholic Church to speak blessing over something like water specifically. And we believe just like God is real, demons are real, there's good and there is evil. And the demons in the world don't like the holy things in the world. So I tell you what, if I go to a hotel, I get my little bottle of holy water, I'm spraying it everywhere, you don't know what's in there, and I'm like, listen, I want Jesus in this place. So uh, take that holy water with you. <laughs> Liz is like, what are you, Mariana? <laughs> so, oh yeah. A real story, and I promise I'm going to stay on topic today. I really, really am, but one time uh, I was with my family, and this is actually before my family became Catholic. So I was with my family in a hotel, and my mom uh, was having a hard time falling asleep, and I told her, I was like, well, I had holy water, and I used holy water in the room. She's like, you have holy water? You didn't give me any? She's like, I don't even know what that is, but I know I want it today. So uh, definitely get your holy water, keep it with you. It's very useful. Um, so thank you, Father, for that little, little tidbit. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and just jump in 
Today we are talking about my favorite thing in the whole wide world, which is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, so I'm going to do a little group survey. Raise your hand if you've ever heard the name of Jesus before. <laughs> Excellent, good. So that's a good starting place for us all to be on the same page. Now, I don't want to make any assumptions about where we are as far as how much we know who Jesus is or about Jesus, because honestly, I learn more and more about Jesus every single day, right? Uh, there is never a, uh, there's never a point where you cross a line and all of a sudden you know everything there is to know about the infinite God who existed before time did, right? Like, you're not that cool, neither am I, it's not going to happen. So uh, even if some of what we talk about today is a refresher for some of you, I really believe the beauty of the Catholic Church is that we can hear these things over and over again and they can retouch us and reconvict us in a new way every time. So I just want to encourage you that if you're sitting out there and you're like, I know who Jesus is, I did Sunday school, I pray every day, that um, maybe there's a chance that our Lord wants to speak to us about familiar things in a new light. So we can all be open in that way. So, let's see. Oh, please work. <laughs> I'm in a constant epic battle with the technology. Okay, so this question, who is Jesus Christ? That's what we're covering today. So, when we're talking about this, I think it's very important for us to consider this question in two separate lights. One is, who is Jesus Christ objectively? So, uh, you may be familiar with this process, right? Like, you meet a person, and you have a first impression of them, right? Like nod your head if you've ever had a first impression of somebody. Maybe your first impression was like, oh, you're a little different. Like, you know, maybe your first impression was we are going to be best friends forever. That's what Liz and I had when we first met. We were like forever, right here, best friends. It was the sparkly binders that really we bonded over. Uh, but, you know, you meet them, but as you're getting to know this person, whoever they may be, you might realize that they've got some personality traits or some facts about them that you would not have assumed at the beginning, right? Uh, maybe, you're, maybe you realize your first impression wasn't 100% accurate. And really, it's so important in our relationships, in all of our relationships, to be trying to get to know a person for their own sake, right? Not just who do I think you are or what can I get from you, but who are you? objectively outside of me what is the truth about who you are which is really why we study theology because we can hear things about God and we can kind of think oh I sort of know something about God but that might not be 100% accurate and what we want to do is get to know who God has revealed himself to be what is the objective truth so theology is like this fancy word it means the study of God and we're trying to study to get to know him for who he really is outside of our perceptions. But then at the same time, it, another equally important question is, who is Jesus Christ to me personally? Now we have to be careful that our personal ideas of who God is don't contradict the objective truth of who he's revealed himself to be, right? Because it's like, that's not, then, then you're just living your own little delusion. What's actually happening when I've done this in the past is I've kind of created a fake Jesus in my own image, right? Like I made up this idea of who I wanted Jesus to be and uh, I'm not getting to know him for his own sake. So um, we want to know the truth, but we also want to know in the truth of who our God is, who does he want to be for me in my personal life? Where is he present in my personal life? What is Jesus Christ, this eternal God, who is personal, speaking to me every single day? So we're going to look at these from these two different perspectives. Uh, in the first, the first part, this getting to know who he is, this is just a little bit of a, of a review. Tim was so wonderful to speak to us for the entire presentation last week uh, about the Holy Trinity, what the Trinity is. Uh, the Trinity, our God, is miraculous, right? Like this, what I'm about to say, what Tim talked about last week, is bigger than we can fully comprehend. But it is the truth of who our God has revealed himself to be, which is that our Trinity, the Trinity, is God, one God. We don't believe in multiple gods. Uh, you may have heard stories of like, 
the Greek pantheon, like the you know you know Zeus, and then we had the other other people believed in Apollo and Aphrodite. We've got all of these different gods throughout all of history. People had all the stories about them. We don't believe in multiple gods. We believe that there is one and only one God. In the Trinity, our God, one God, has revealed himself to be three persons. Three who is it, three who in one what, one God. Again, that's a little complicated. If you're sitting there thinking, I can't wrap my mind around this, then you're probably doing it right. <laughs> Um, but this, I found these things to be helpful. In, Catholic, uh, the, in, in the Catholic world, we've got lots of different symbols for God, lots of different symbols in our art. So we've got this image up front uh, at the top there, the hand. We often see uh, God the Father depicted as a hand because he reached out, created the world. So we've got this hand for who God is. Then the lamb is often a symbol of who Jesus is. So we've got God the Father in this symbol. It also says Yahweh. Tim talked to us about how God's name in the Old Testament was revealed as Yahweh. And then underneath Abba, A-B-B-A, I don't know if you can see that from where you're sitting. Uh, Abba was actually the Aramaic word for daddy. It's this incredibly intimate and personal relationship with God the Father. Jesus called God Abba. He told us that his father, our father, is not just father like, you know, this uh, distant figure, but that he is Abba, that he is so close to us that he is actually daddy, that that is the relationship we can have with him. Um, Jesus is, uh, the, uh, the person of Jesus is often depicted as a lamb because he revealed himself to us as the sacrificial lamb. We'll get into more of that. And then the Holy Spirit is often depicted with a dove or with fire. Uh, I used to tell people all the time, listen, people, the Holy Spirit is not a bird, right? Like, we use this to remind us of who he is. But if you're thinking the entire Holy Spirit that is greater than we can wrap our minds around is actually just like a pigeon, you're a little off, right? So he's not a pigeon. He is God. But uh, he's represented in these images to help us wrap our little human minds around them. So uh, all three of these persons are God, but they are distinct from each other. So up here, it's, a little, it's like a little, little Catholic flow chart here. We've got God the Father, who is God, but is not the Son or the Spirit. The Son is not the Father or the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father or the Son. All three are God. Um, one of the ways that I believe Bishop Barron might have described it, sorry if I'm uh, messing up my sources a little bit, but one of the things that stands out to me the most is that uh, throughout the entire history of the universe, before the universe actually existed, before time existed, God the Father existed, God the Son existed, God the Spirit existed. The Father infinitely loved the Son, and the Son infinitely loved the Father in such a powerful way that that love actually became a person, the person of the Holy Spirit. So this is a little recap for those of us who might have missed last week. Um, but. Jesus Christ, who is Jesus Christ? Who has he revealed himself to be? He has revealed himself to be God, fully God, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son. So he's saying in the name of the Father and then in the name of the Son. That's another way of saying in the name of Jesus Christ. So this is a little bit of the objective theology, right? Now, another thing that we're trying to do when we're trying to get to know someone is we want to know their story. What is their story? So now we know you know, what is Jesus? He is, who is Jesus? He is the second person of the Trinity. What is his story? His story starts before time. That's another thing. If you want to give yourself a headache, you sit there, try to figure that out. Good luck. Get back to me if you can, because <laughs> no, I cannot. But he existed before time did. Sorry, I'm trying not to stand in front of everybody. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, when you Google that, uh, if you're trying to find an image like this, it's like, okay, I need an image for before time, space, pictures, colors existed. Help me out, right? It's like, it's not gonna happen. But we've got this nifty one of the planet, which I thought was about as close as we can get. There was no time. There was no space. The world was void. God the Father existed through the Son and the Spirit. He created the entire earth. So we think of who is Jesus Christ? He is the light that entered the darkness of the void. Jesus Christ is the light that entered the darkness 
of the void when there was nothing and out of nothing our God created everything that we have. Not only did he create the planets and the stars and the birds, he created man. And this is so important because in scripture it says, you know, God created the earth and it was good. God created the birds, it was good, right? We got chickens running around. If you're ever asking yourself, chicken or the egg, which came first, scripture doesn't say it. And then God said, let there be eggs. He said, let there be chickens. Catholics know the answer. There you go. So um, <laughs> let there be birds and things that fly. Uh, so, but he, out of all of those things, every time he made something, he said, this is good. This is good. But then scripture is very clear. It says that when God created man, when the light came into the darkness and he made everything that we know and we see, he created man, it says he made him in his image and his likeness. Male and female, he created them. So what that means is that out of everything in the world, he made us uniquely to be like him. This is where it's so important for us to know who Jesus Christ is. Because if you're sitting there thinking, okay, God is this abstract concept, you know, there's like a, some kind of deity floating around in the universe, but I'm supposedly made in his image and likeness, we're trying to figure out this other important question, who are we, right? So Jesus Christ is the revealed person of God who shows us not just who he is, but also who we are. So God created man. Got God the Father, some angels up here. I also, I, I really like this. So I don't know if you can see from where you're sitting in the light, but in this image, you've got God the Father, and then he's got his arm around, there are angels all around, but he's got his arm around this woman. And I, I especially like it because he's creating Adam, right? Making him in his image and likeness. You see God's hand is strong. Adam's hand is kind of weak because we're pretty puny in comparison. But the woman that God has his arm around, that's Eve, right? So he's like making Adam, but he's got the treasure right here. He's holding her until the last moment. The crown of creation, the last thing that our Lord created was woman. You are all welcome. Um, so, <laughs> so we've got the creation of man, Jesus Christ. But then we know the story, uh, or we may know the story. You may have heard the story before that God created man. We were walking with him together in the garden, right? So garden, paradise, no woes, no worries, no concerns. Right now you wake up in the morning, maybe your first thought is like, why? And your second thought is coffee, right? Like all these concerns that you experience every day, none of those in the garden. You know what I'm saying? You weren't, you weren't worried about jobs. You weren't worried about calories that come with donuts. Speaking of which, there are donuts. Y'all see how I did that? Um, but we, we had no concerns whatsoever. God told, say, he made one rule. Now, if you're a parent, you know what this is like, right? I, you're like, child, I would give my life for you. I asked you to not do this one thing, one thing, just the one thing, right? Like, don't put your hand on the stove. I promise there's a reason, right? It is good for you. I love you. Why? We don't have to talk about why, because I like the skin to be on your hand, right? Like, this is why we're arguing. Don't put your hand on the stove, the one thing I asked. And inevitably, human beings were like, mm, but you know what? Bam! Hand on the stove. I've got to try this thing. I'm going to take, take things out of God's will into my own will uh, to choose something that is not what God planned for us. So God went ahead and he, uh, it, like a good father, he allowed us to experience the consequence of the action that, that took place. So in the garden, God created man and woman. They're in the garden. They're walking daily with God, perfectly in relationship with God, right? And they chose to break the one rule. God said, do not eat the fruit of this one tree. There's the, not a tree, one tree, one tree. Don't put your hand on the stove, one tree. And they rejected God's plan. They listened to the temptations of the devil and they separated themselves from God. It says Satan, uh, the devil in scripture, he tells them uh, the reason that God doesn't want you to do this is because then it would make you like God. So he tells us this lie that, yes, God exists, but I tell you what, he doesn't have your best interest in mind. Really, all you got to do is try this one thing. You, you know, it might not be what he wanted you to do, but it's going to make your life better. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I have sinned a few times in my life, once or twice. 
like in the last 10 minutes, right? But, <laughs> but I have sinned a few times and every time it's because I looked at something and I was like, you know what, this looks good. I know it's probably not what my father wants for me, but I'm gonna go ahead and just put my hand on that stove real quick to see what happens. Maybe this time my way's better, never better. I'm going into this in so much detail because this is where it becomes so important for us to understand why Jesus Christ, who is Jesus Christ, why he came. Humanity separated themselves from God. Here in this image, we've got the angel uh, uh, sending, escorting Adam and Eve out of the garden of paradise because they have rejected the beauty of God's plan for their own. When we reject our God, you know, we ask this question, why do bad things happen in the world? We reject our God, and it separates us from his infinite love and his infinite plan. But here's the thing. Our God loves us so much he doesn't want us to be robots, right? He could have just made it like I make one rule and humans don't have an option to choose something else. But instead, he made it so that we have this freedom. And the fact that we can freely choose to reject God's love is also the freedom that allows us to choose to love. Does that make sense? So he left us this freedom. But like any good father... There is a consequence that comes, a natural consequence that comes with our decision to disobey. And so Adam and Eve are separated from the garden, which starts this really long process of covenants. So a covenant is a, a relationship. You might think of a covenant and think like a contract, but actually it's something even deeper. A covenant is an extension of kinship. In, in scripture, it's an ex extension of kinship by oath. So I'm adopted, and that means that I have a covenantal relationship with my adopted family because my adopted parents extended by oath this kinship, this relationship, this intimacy, this familial relationship with me. So we have a covenant. There was a covenant, this kinship relationship between God the Father and Adam and Eve. They rejected that. Then we have the entire history. Remember all those Bible stories you may have heard? You, you know, you see like little Noah's Ark toys. Nod your head if you've ever seen Noah's Ark toys or heard Bible stories. Okay, good. We're all kind of on the same page. So uh, you hear all these stories throughout all of history. We call it salvation history. We've got God extending his kinship saying, okay, you messed up. You walked away, but I love you. I want to bring you back in. And humans are like, that sounds great. We're all about it. Yes, we're going to walk with you, God. And I have done that so many times in my life. And then very quickly, it's like 30 seconds later, I'm like, and actually back to my own plan, right? So <laughs> terrible idea, never works. But throughout all of history, humans are uh, offered this relationship with God. They enter into that relationship, and then they choose sin over and over. And really, it's choosing this slavery to sin. Because even though they think they're choosing to be master of their own actions, they can't stop choosing the thing that hurts them, which means they're really slaves. We are really slaves. And so Noah's Ark is an example that uh, humanity had turned so far away from God and rejected God so much. Uh, God started everything over. There was a great flood. But then he restored he restored humanity through Noah, this extension of kinship, this extension of a covenant of relationship, and started things over, and then they sinned again. And this happens over and over again. All those Bible stories, so we've got Noah's Ark, we've got, uh, this is when Moses was up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments, so the Lord is giving him these uh, these parameters, right? It's like, okay, well, you guys keep having such a hard time sticking with the rules and like following a relationship. I'm going to make it so clear for you. These are the things that will hurt you. Don't put your hand on the stove. Don't sin. This is how you do it. And this is how you walk with me. God's extending this relationship again in another covenant. They're rejecting him again because, well, Moses is up on, he's literally like, okay, guys, listen, I'm going to go up on the mountain. I'm going to meet with God. I'm going to talk to God for just a few minutes. It was actually 40 days, but he's like, I'm going to go up there. I'm going to have this relationship. You know, we're, we're going to figure, we're going to sort out the nonsense we've gotten ourselves into. Now, mind you, this is after uh, God freed his people from slavery in Egypt. So they have seen God's power. They have seen miracles. He says, okay, I'm going to go up on the mountain. We're going to start, restart the relationship. He's up on the mountain for a few days and they start worshiping idols, right? So they're down here. They're like, you know what? 
it's been 20 minutes. God probably doesn't exist anymore. Let's make our own God, right? So they're making idols. Um, they're, they create this golden calf. They start worshiping the golden calf. Moses comes back down the mountain. He's like, I just saw God. I had this beautiful experience. I've got the Ten Commandments, which God, God carved onto tablets with his own hand. Like, here are the rules. Don't touch the stove. We're going to do this again. Moses gets down the mountain, and they're like, by the way, we made a new God. He's like, I give you one job. One job, right? So we see this over and over and over again that God is performing miracles beyond comprehension throughout all of Scripture. You might have noticed I could go on and on about them. But throughout, throughout all of Scripture, he's extending this relationship. And humans are like, okay, we're going to do it. And then they reject him again and again and again. What became clear is that there was only going to be one way to fully heal and restore this relationship. Because when you reject an infinite God, a perfect God, who has loved you perfectly and infinitely, we as finite, imperfect humans cannot restore that relationship. We just can't. You know? You think about, think about the worst thing that someone could possibly do to you. Now, for most of us, that involves like, if someone killed a loved one or some, something like that. Like, so you think about the worst thing that could possibly happen, you could possibly imagine. And now imagine if that person like, you know, wrote a sticky note that said sorry and like stuck it on your car. It's like incomprehensible amounts of gap, right? You can't even wrap your mind around how far it was. You know, take that and multiply it infinitely. We're looking at humanity's relationship with God, the eternal God who loved us so much that he created us. Didn't have to, right? He was perfectly, infinitely happy. Just with the Trinity, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit doing their thing. He created us in perfect love. We rejected him completely. The only way for that relationship to be healed was for him to heal it. For him to be the one who came down and literally paid the price of our slavery. We sold ourselves into sin, into this bondage of rejecting God. And it required an infinite price. Which brings us to, who is this person of Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ, God the Son, loved us, loves us so infinitely that he descended into our muck, right? All of the humanity, all of our sin, all of our struggle, all of our emotional weaknesses and our pain and our suffering. God never had a paper cut. Jesus Christ came onto earth and was willing to take on suffering. In this moment, this is one of my favorite images. Actually, it's a little, little wonky uh, in the lighting here. But this is Mary. Catholics believe that Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. That God the Father sent his Son, and God the Son, Jesus Christ, freely accepted that will, that decision of the Father, and came into the earth through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now this is where, if you've never heard this stuff before, I get it if what I'm about to say sounds completely nuts. And I just want to come back to the fact that in faith we believe that our God in the supernatural is bigger than what we can see and comprehend in the natural. And that he has revealed certain truths about himself that we assent to, we agree to, we choose to believe through the grace of faith, through the gift of faith, the virtue of faith. So we believe that the Holy Spirit, that third person of the Trinity, overshadowed. That's the word that's used in scripture. It's like, uh, it's actually the same word is used whenever they're talking about this cloud of glory, like this incomprehensible, beautiful cloud of God's presence, that he overshadowed a young virgin girl, a Hebrew girl. See, the beautiful thing about all of those uh, Bible stories I was telling you about, you know, you look at the Old Testament in Scripture, and it's like, it's a chunk, right? Like, there's a lot going on in there. All of these stories, we're talking thousands of years, and it's, 
It's this journey of God having a specific group of people that when everyone else was worshiping these pagan gods in terrible, terrible ways. I mean, you, you read about some of these, uh, the, the demands of worship of these pagan gods, and it involved sacrificing children. It involved uh, all sorts of horrific, horrific things. There was one people, one group of people, the Jews, the Hebrews, that believed in the one God. And this was the chosen people throughout all of those stories. Now, even they kept rejecting and coming back and rejecting and coming back. But there was the one chosen people. And from this chosen people was chosen this young girl, Mary. Catholics make a big deal about Mary, right? If you have ever, uh, if you have ever been a non-Catholic, I know some of us here are Catholic, some of us are not. But it, uh, in a lot of Protestant denominations, they think that Catholics uh, believe that Mary is a goddess or that uh, we give too much credit to Mary, that, uh, that we treat her as being too special and it takes the focus off of Jesus. But really what it comes down to is we believe our God is so big and so good that throughout all of time and space he chose to enter humanity through this one person. Jesus Christ chose to enter humanity through one specific person. And just like God allows us free will, allows me free will every day, this one person, this 14-year-old little girl, had a, a choice of whether she was going to accept or reject God's invitation to relationship. And she said yes. We call that her fiat. It's her perfect yes. So here we are. We've got this little girl. And then this you, it kind of cuts the image off, which is unfortunate. But you can see this light. That, what that is, it might look like a wall, but it's really in the, in the bigger picture. It's this bright shining light because we believe that an angel appeared to this young girl and said God the Father is I'm I'm seriously paraphrasing here <laughs> he said what he actually said was hail Mary full of grace the Lord is with you we pray that as Catholics um, and he went on to invite her to become the mother of the Savior the mother of the Messiah said the Holy Spirit will come upon you, will overshadow you, and you will conceive and bear a son. Mary has a pretty natural response, which is, how's that going to happen? Because I, I've never known a man, right? She's like, okay, I'm with you. Quick question. Just seems like a logistical thing, right? <laughs> How is this going to happen? The power of the Holy Spirit overshadowed her, and she conceived. Now, raise your hand if you've ever heard of Christmas. Okay, perfect, thanks. <laughs> Even Matt's like, it. <laughs> we all know the story of Christmas. Um, we've all seen a lot of images of the Trinity, or the Trinity, well that too, but of the Nativity. So I chose this one, which is kind of an Eastern style of art. Um, but we know that Mary and Joseph traveled to Bethlehem. There was a star involved. Uh, we'll get more into this around Christmas time, but what we believe is that the infinite and perfect God chose to be born of a lowly virgin, a poor young girl who, from everyone else's perspective, got pregnant out of wedlock, right? Which was something punishable by stoning. So we're talking, this is not him being born into glory, right? This is truly him stepping into our muck, literally to the point where they laid him in a manger, which was like a trough for feeding animals. I don't know if you've ever fed animals before, but you can't even get like a dog to keep their dish clean, let alone an entire barn full, right? We're talking like a messy, dirty, muck-filled manger. And our God chose to enter in and to be born into that situation because he chooses Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? He is the infinite and perfect God who chooses to be present to us in our muck. There's also something really beautiful about the fact that within the very first moments of his life on this earth, he chose to be put into a container that was used for food. We're going to get into that in just a little bit. All right, I promise I'm going to move through this a little bit quicker. So uh, this is an image of the wedding feast at Cana which is where Jesus performed his first miracle. It wasn't until he was 30 years old. Uh, there's kind of this gap in scripture. We don't really know what Jesus was doing completely. It just says that he went home with his parents and that he was obedient to them and he grew 
in knowledge and in stature in the eyes of men. So he went home, he was obedient to his parents. Insert 30 years, right? 30 years of growth and preparation. And then the first time that we see him performing a miracle is that uh, he's at this wedding feast and his mother approaches him and says, they have no wine, they ran out of wine, right? Now, Jesus responds and he's like, woman, what is this concern? Why is this my concern? This has nothing to do with me, essentially. And um, it's this beautiful moment because she doesn't respond, get sassy. All she does is she looks at the servants who are there and she says, do whatever he tells you to. And I think this is a beautiful image of not just Jesus' relationship with this mama, but our relationship with her, right? That we can go to her because scripture teaches us how to live and how to pray. We can go to her and say, I've got a problem. And she takes it to Jesus. And then Jesus does what is best for us, you know? So this is the relationship that we have with her. So he performs this first miracle and it launches his ministry. Jesus has three years of active ministry on the earth where he's walking around. And this is where you hear these stories about the miracles, right? So all of a sudden we've got, oh, oh, calm down. Here we go. We've got Jesus here and he's healing blind people. He's healing lepers. There are people who are, get ready for this, dead, no longer alive. And then Jesus speaks to them. And they sit up and start being alive again. So we're talking some pretty serious stuff is going on. And all of these prophecies are being fulfilled. <laughs> Y'all did not react to that the way that like it makes sense to react, right? It's like there were dead people and then they were not dead. And y'all are like, yeah, I know this is like a normal Tuesday. For no, guys, we're talking not normal stuff is happening, okay? There is a man walking around, son of a carpenter. Everybody kind of knows, like, he was born in that sticky situation. They weren't quite married. What exactly was happening? He's just a normal guy from everyone's perspective. And all of a sudden, dead people aren't dead anymore, right? And this actually goes back to the Old Testament, all those stories I was telling you about. All throughout the Old Testament, there are these prophecies Humans, humanity, the God's people, we are in sin, we have rejected him, but there will come one, one Messiah, who will perform miracles. We will know him through the miracles that he performs. He will fulfill these prophecies. And he will be the one who saves us from our slavery. So when he's walking around and doing stuff like rubbing mud on somebody's eyes, and they go from blind to 2020, right? These are miracles that are fulfilling prophecies, and it's telling us this big question, who is Jesus Christ? He's the fulfillment of the prophecy. So he's performing the miracles, and he's not just performing miracles. Whoop, oh my goodness, here we go. He's not just performing miracles. He is establishing a church. We believe that Jesus Christ is king, and that his kingdom is both here on earth, on earth, as it is in heaven, that he is king of heaven and earth and under the earth, that he is the king of the universe. He's establishing his kingdom here on earth. One of the stories in scripture is this moment where Peter, uh, Jesus is walking with his apostles. That's his 12. He chose 12 men to be especially close to him. He's got lots of followers at this point, right? Because you start healing people and raising them from the dead and people are paying attention. He's got lots of followers, but he's got his 12. These are his main men, right? And he's teaching them in a special way. He's actually speaking to them, giving them unique truth, telling them things about himself that other people are not hearing, revealing things to him. And the one that he is speaking to the most, that you hear uh, Jesus talking to the most, interacting with the most, putting in the positions of authority, this is this man named Peter. Actually, his name is Simon when Jesus first meets him. And then Jesus changes his name to Peter. When you're God, you can do that. You can be like, you know what? That's not your name anymore. New name, Peter. So um, I can't do that, but God can. So <laughs> thank you guys for laughing at my jokes. It makes me feel better. <laughs> so we've got this image here. Jesus is giving the keys to Peter because in the book of Matthew, Matthew 16, Jesus actually is speaking to Peter and he asks Peter, who do you say that I am? Who am I? And Peter looks back at him and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Big moment, right? It's one of those things that everybody's kind of thinking. Nobody says it out loud. Like, hmm, this might be God. That's a weird thing to say, so we're not going to mention it. Jesus looks at him 
And he and Peter responds and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus says, blessed are you, Peter, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, Simon bar Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah, because this has not been revealed to you by flesh and blood, but it has been revealed to you by my father who is in heaven. What he's saying is you, Peter, are special. He says, from now on, your name will be Peter. And upon this rock, Peter, Petra means rock, upon this rock, I will build my church. So who is Jesus? He is the infinite God who stepped into our muck, who fulfilled the prophecies, performed the miracles, came, lived with us, walked with us, and established his church so that his people would no longer be just the Jews, just the Hebrew people, aimless, walking around in a land never actually feeling at home. This has been the entire history of the Hebrew people. But that God's people would now, this, this group, this, this kingdom would be expanded to all of us, Jews and Gentiles, the non-Jews, right? And that that kingdom would actually be led by a group of men who had been given the specific truth. He is the infinite God who stepped in and established his kingdom. And then, oh my goodness, there we go. He's performing all these miracles. One of the miracles that he performs is that he multiplies the loaves and fishes. Sorry, that picture is a little hard to see, but he multiplies the loaves and fishes. And he reveals himself to us as the one who gives us the bread of life, right? There are 4,000 people. It actually says 4,000 people, not counting the women and children. It's like, okay, well, that would be 4,000 men, which is not all the people. But anyways, um, so 4,000 people, not counting the women and children, which hypothetically could have made the group much, much bigger. Yep. And... They're all hungry. They've been following Jesus for a long time. They've had no food, and they are not near Walmart, right? Like, there is no food to be had. And Jesus looks at his apostles and says, well, give them some food. And the 12 apostles are like, listen, I know you have kind of revealed yourself to know everything, but I would like to talk to you about how math works because we can't actually pull this off. Long story short, Jesus multiplies the loaves and fishes. He's given this small amount of food and he multiplies it and feeds all of God's people. Y'all see where I'm going with this? He takes something that is natural and simple and multiplies it to nourish everyone. Now, this is an important jump I'm about to make here. As we fast forward through the story of Jesus' life, I hope you guys can kind of see this. This is the image of the Last Supper. You may have seen it before. It's where Jesus is at the table. The apostles are all on the side. I heard this joke once that was like, can you imagine the apostles going and, and asking for, you know, the place to sit, uh, asking for the table to be set up? And they're like, all right, we're going to need a table for, uh, let's see, 26, 26. And they're like, are there 26 people coming? No, 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 no. It's, it's just the 12 and... Then Jesus and some other Marys there, but we're all going to sit on one side, <laughs> just on one side. So now this this painting was originally done by uh, Leonardo da Vinci. I almost said DiCaprio, which would not be true. Uh, Leonardo <laughs> Leonardo da Vinci, um, and he's depicting this Last Supper on the Thursday before Jesus's death. They were at the Passover, which is a sacred meal in the Hebrew tradition that commemorates when God set them free from slavery and brought them into freedom. And Jesus, the same eternal God who stepped into our muck and established his kingdom, takes bread, normal bread in his hands, in the same way that he took normal bread in his hands before. He breaks the bread. He blesses it. and He says, this is my body given up for you. If you're a Catholic or if you've been to Catholic Mass before, you've heard these words because they're prayed by the priest who is speaking through the authority of Christ. This is my body. And we as Catholics believe that Jesus Christ, who can raise the dead, heal the blind, fulfill the prophecies throughout all of time, actually has the authority as the God of the universe 
to just like he multiplied the loaves and bread in a way that our brains cannot comprehend, the loaves of bread in a way that our brains cannot comprehend, that he can actually make this transformation happen. That when he says, this is my body, he didn't like make a slip in his speech, right? Because Jesus doesn't actually make mistakes. So it's not like he meant to say, this is a symbol of my body and I would like you to kind of do a similar thing later. He says, this is my body given up for you. Then he goes on and he takes the, the wine, he blesses it and he says, this is the cup of my blood the cup of the new and eternal covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. Who is Jesus Christ? He is the infinite God, the second person of the Trinity, who stepped into our muck, who healed our brokenness by fulfilling these prophecies and all of these extensions of covenants. He establishes a kingdom, and within the context of that kingdom, he gives us, he speaks over, he gives us his body and his blood. We'll talk about this a lot more in depth later, but we believe as Catholics that Jesus Christ is truly present in the body and blood that is the Eucharist. The bread and the wine that we celebrate, or, uh, that the priest prays over at the Mass, actually through the same miraculous God who existed then and still exists now becomes his body and blood. Who is Jesus Christ? He is our Eucharistic Lord. That bread and wine is no longer just bread and wine. It has actually completely changed. The substance of it is transformed. There's a fancy Catholic word, transubstantiation. You get bonus points if you remember that one. Uh, transubstantiation. It changes into his body and his blood. That night, that Thursday night, Jesus leaves the, uh, the celebration of the Last Supper, the celebration of Passover, actually before the Passover ceremony is completed. There's usually this whole ceremony with a fourth cup. Uh, they, they have several uh, passings of, of cups commemorating the covenant, and, and there's this whole ritual involved. And all of these Hebrew men have been celebrating this every year their entire lives right and all of a sudden jesus is like pause we're done before it's over we're getting up we're going totally would have thrown everybody off but he goes he takes the apostles into the garden of gethsemane which is still there in the holy land you can go there and you can see this the garden of gethsemane and he separates himself from them a little bit and he prays who is jesus christ he is this eternal God who prayed in the garden because he knew what was about to happen to him. He knew that he was about to take the weight of the entire world and the history of sin of all of humanity, all of the covenants that were broken, all the way through here today, me, my sin. He knew he was going to take all of that on. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever experienced like that feeling of guilt, you do something wrong. And it just eats at you, you know? Like it's just, you can't get rid of it. And you're trying to shove it down or ignore it and it won't let you go, right? You know that feeling of shame, the suffering that comes with it? Jesus took on all of that for all of us throughout all of human history, right? And he knew that this was going to involve, like the sacrifice, the price that had to be paid was going to be so intense. He didn't want to do it. He's there in the garden and he's so afraid, he's so stressed out that he's actually, it says that he sweat drops of blood, which is an actual medical condition that if the human body, the human person is put under such strain, the capillaries in their body, it, they actually start bursting and their pores start secreting blood, right? That that is the level of stress and pain and suffering that he was ready to, that he was experiencing as he was preparing for what was going to come next. He actually prayed, Father, he's talking to Abba, Daddy, Father in heaven. Let this cup pass from me. This cup, this thing that you're asking of me, let it pass from me. I don't want this to happen. But, and if you want to know how to pray, this is how to do it. I don't want to do this. 
but not my will, not my will, but your will be done. And in this, he submitted to the Father, saying, listen, my flesh, my body does not want this to happen, but I submit to you. And then he freely chose his suffering and death. Now, historical accounts of all of this exist, right? This isn't just like Mariana standing here and she's like, okay, listen, I'm going to tell you a story. There was an angel, then a virgin conceived, okay? Some dead people stopped being dead. There were some loaves, some fishes. Like, this isn't just Mariana making all this up, right? There are historical accounts of these things happening outside of just the Bible, right? Because it wouldn't make sense for us to be like, it's true because the Bible says it's true and we believe in the Bible because it says stuff right like nope self-defeating there are external accounts of all of this jesus christ was apprehended by the pharisees uh, they were the leaders of the jewish people but they had become a lot more obsessed with the temporal things the earthly things than with the things that were eternal they weren't thinking about the prophecies uh and, and the, seeing how Jesus was fulfilling this as much as they were thinking about how uh, Jesus was turning the people against them and against their rules and their regulations. Uh, and so they wanted to get rid of him, right? They, they wanted him to die. And so they collaborated with the Romans, was the secular government of the time. Uh, and they had Jesus arrested. And then went through this entire story. I'm not going to go into all of the details of how they went through this entire story. Jesus was scourged. He took on this suffering of being scourged. Now, a scourging, you may or may not be like, can you just, can we do a quick poll? Uh, can you just kind of nod your head for me if you've heard of this story of Jesus' suffering and death before? Okay, so some of us, not all of us, that's totally fine. Um, I strongly recommend... Maybe not today, but as we get closer to Easter, we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk about this a little bit more. I strongly recommend watching the movie The Passion of the Christ. I also strongly recommend that you have at least one box of tissues next to you. I don't care who you are, you're going to want them. Okay, so um, <clears throat> uh, it, it's the story of Jesus' suffering and death. But here we are. We're talking about Jesus, and he's taking on this sin. A price has to be paid. A sacrifice has to be made to bring healing to these, this relationship with God the Father. He was scourged, which means that they, uh, Pontius Pilate, who was the Roman, the secular leader at the time, he ordered that Jesus be scourged as his punishment. The Pharisees, the leaders of the Jewish people, said, you know, we want him to die. Pontius Pilate pushed back and said, I, don't, I see that he has done no wrong. Uh, we're just going to have him scourged and then released. Now, in order for a man to be scourged, what they did was they took something called the cat of nine tails, which was a whip that actually had nine different whips attached to it. And on the end of these whips, there was broken glass, pieces of metal, uh, jagged hooks. And they took these nine of these whips covered in these sharp, jagged materials and hooks, and they scourged him. They beat him with this whip, with these uh, devices of torture. And we have something called the Shroud of Turin, which we believe is actually the, the cloth that Jesus' body was wrapped in after his death. And it says that it shows us that this man, that the Shroud wrapped his body, was covered from head to toe, that there was almost no piece of his flesh that hadn't been ripped apart. So when we're thinking, who is Jesus Christ? He's the infinite God who never had to suffer, and he chose a suffering that is absolutely incomprehensible because he would rather go through that than be separated from us. After he was whipped, you would have thought that would be enough, but the Pharisees were not satisfied. They demanded that he be crucified. Crucifixion was a Roman... Uh, method of execution for the very worst of criminals. Now let's be clear, there is absolutely nothing that could be proven that Jesus Christ did wrong by any law. But they gave him this punishment for the very worst of criminals. In a crucifixion, the criminal would carry their cross up to the hill. 
And so on his broken and beaten body, after he's already endured more suffering than I can even begin to imagine, he's carrying this beam. Now in this image, you see the whole cross, which is the, the both pieces, um, <clears throat> the vertical and the horizontal. What actually probably would have happened was it would be just the horizontal piece, which would have weighed at least 180 pounds. So this is put across his shoulders and he drags it up the side of this hill. The hill itself, Calvary, is called Golgotha, the place of the skull. He drags the cross up the hill. He falls multiple times. They're beating him and screaming at him as he goes. After he makes it through this incredible suffering, they nail him to the cross. There are nails that are inserted in his wrists and in his feet to actually hold him there. And then our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who decided that he would rather suffer in agony than spend eternity without us, hung there for three hours. Now, you might think that if someone's going through this that they're going to die, but they'll die from blood loss or uh, from their wounds. But actually what happens in a crucifixion is that the person who's hanging suffocates to death because they can't get air in their lungs slowly fill with blood. Now, I'm not trying to gross anybody out. You know, I know that I'm talking about blood, I'm talking about a lot of different kind of bodily sufferings, but I think it's important for us to know the truth of what happened on that day. I am gonna make it through this without crying. So, <laughs> I'm gonna do it. <laughs> who is Jesus Christ? He's the God who was willing to do what he didn't have to do so that we could have a love and access to life when we were dead in our sin. As he hung there on that cross, the only way for him to get a single breath was for him to push up on his feet, which were nailed to this tree. And so he would push up on his feet and pull on the nails in his arms so that he could take in one breath. He did that for three hours. And over the course of that three hours, there are a bunch of other things that he said to the people who were there, his mother, Mary, the same 14-year-old girl who chose to say yes and take on this suffering, uh, who chose to be the mother of the Savior. She was there at the foot of the cross with him. She chose to say yes and to be there not just when it was good, but there at the foot of the cross, just like she is present to us in our suffering. He spoke to her. We're going to get into more of that later. But the important thing to know, who is Jesus Christ? He is love incomprehensible love. He is the witness of how we are supposed to love, to give ourselves to the people in our lives and in the world. And that's how Jesus died. And by any normal standard in the entire universe, that would be the end of the story. But it is not. <laughs> right? <laughs> now again, you guys are like, Okay, I know. No, you don't, right? Like, this is not, I'm not about just saying a normal thing. This is not a normal day. This is not normal. These are not normal words. And it's not just because I'm not a normal person, even though that's true. Like, what I'm about to say is completely insane in the eyes of the natural. And we get used to hearing it because, you know, like, you've heard it before. Or because somebody said it. Or you're Catholic. Or not Catholic. Whatever. I'm about to say a crazy thing. Which is, he rose from the dead. Right. <laughs> cool. He rose from, he was dead. They took his body. They, he gave it to his mother. She held the body of her dead son. They wrapped the body in a cloth, in burial clothes. They put him in a tomb, which was a cave with a Big, big, big stone, right? Boulder in front of the cave, close it up. People are, who followed him are mourning. They're thinking, I thought he was God. My whole world is turned upside down. Pharisees are like, done with that guy. The Romans are like, we don't have to pay attention to the Pharisees anymore. The Pharisees said, you know what? 
this guy said he was going to rise from the dead. He's talking to the Romans. It didn't sound like this, but we're just going to go with it. He said he was going to rise from the dead. So could you have guards put out there just to make sure, just for a few days, make sure that they can't, you know, his followers can't come and start an uprising and say he rose from the dead. So they've got guards standing outside of the tomb covered with the boulder. The man has been in the tomb, right? In the tomb, how many days? Three days, dead, not alive, dead, no breathing, dead, in the tomb with a boulder, okay? Day number three, Sunday, Easter. You know what happens? Let me tell you. Angel shows up, an angel. This is one of my favorite verses in all of scripture and I laugh every single time I hear it. It says, he rolled away the boulder and sat on it. <laughs> He's like, boom! <laughs> what you got? <laughs> the Romans, the soldiers, right? These are huge men carrying huge swords, unconscious, on the ground, body no longer in the tomb. Why? Dead man now walking. Rose from the dead. Now, if you are not a Christian and you're hearing that, you're like crazy person. And listen, I get it. And if it wasn't for the fact that they're, they've never found the body. This is historically verified. Another movie that you can go home and watch is called The Case for Christ. It's a, the story of an atheist news reporter who decided he was going to disprove Christianity by proving that Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead. And you know what? Lynchpin. If he didn't, we're all wrong. Go home. Take a donut. It was nice knowing you. But here's the thing. It did happen. He rose from the dead. You should still eat the donuts. So, <laughs> he rose from the dead. And this is, the, this is the truth that is worth dying for. Because we have a God. Who is Jesus Christ? He is the God who stepped into our sin, who fulfilled the prophecies, who established the kingdom, who gave himself to us in his body and his blood, who suffered, who died, who rose, and by rising from the dead, he defeated death and he defeated sin. And that does not just mean that all those Hebrews worshiping their idols, that he defeated sin for them. It means he defeated sin for me, my sin, my struggle, addiction, hopelessness, depression, whatever the darkness is in our lives, he rose from the dead and we rise with him. And that's what baptism is. That is that we are crucified with Christ and we rise with him. I'm going to get into that more later, I promise. But this is it. Who is Jesus Christ? He is the God who defeated sin and death. And he established a church. Now let's be very clear. I want to be very clear, upfront, honest. The Catholic Church is a mess, okay? Mess filled with humans who generally suck, right? Like we are just awful at pretty much everything we try to do, right? There is basically nothing I do that is void of my pride and me wanting everybody to think I'm fancy, you know, and like this is me wanting things to be done my way in my time. Everything I do is tainted by my sin and brokenness. And that's why I have a relationship with Jesus because he rushes in constantly and fills in the gaps and helps me to improve and to be more like him, okay? But this is it. He established a kingdom, the Catholic Church. And that's why we're here in RCIA. This is an image, I love this image of Jesus. It's divine mercy because when, uh, when he was on the cross, they pierced his heart. After he had died, they pierced his heart with a lance. And it says blood and water rushed forth. And that blood and water is an image of his divine mercy for us, pouring out and covering us in this church that he established. So who is Jesus Christ? He is fully God and fully man. He wasn't part God, part man. He was completely God and completely man. He is our Savior. He is our Eucharistic Lord. He is the way. He has shown us the way back to the Father. He is the life that fills the darkness and death of our sin. He is the truth. The truth. When we're constantly asking what is true, what is real, what is good. He is the truth. Who is Jesus Christ? So now I just want to take, so every, I used to do this when I was giving talks. Everybody take a deep breath in, deep breath out. 
Some of y'all are like, I'm too cool to do that, but it's fine. You do a great job breathing anyways. Um, so I just want to thank you. <laughs> thank you all for going through all of that. We literally just covered like, I don't know, a few thousand years worth of history in a few minutes. So I know it's not always the easiest thing to listen to somebody talk, especially me, but we did it. Good job. You did it. Um, now I've got this question. I know that I just talked a while and it's going to take a second to like switch gears in our brains, but we've got 18 minutes left. Holy cow, Mariana. Uh, we've got 18 minutes left. I want us to just take a second and think about this question. And then if anyone wants to share, I, I, this is a time where that's, you can do that, right? Like a couple things we could talk about if there's anything in all the, the talking I just did, everything I just shared with you, if there's anything that stood out particularly or maybe shown in a new light, something you hadn't heard before or just hadn't thought of in a particular way, um, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. And then also this question. Now this is a much more personal. This is a very intimate question, so don't feel like you've got to you know, pour your guts out right now because it's not expected. Um, but it's something for us all to think about. This infinite God who became personal who, who had, sorry, that was a heresy. This infinite God who is personal and always has been personal and stepped into our personal lives in a physical way. Um, do we have a relationship with him? Have I even ever thought about having a relationship with him? Do I want one? And if I do, what can I do to move towards that or maybe to improve the relationship I have? So these are all questions. Everybody can take a breath. Why don't we like, you can, I'll just give a couple minutes uh, and if you want to get a donut, get some more coffee, stretch, we can do that. And uh, then we'll, I mean, actually like just a couple of minutes. But if you want to stand up and stretch a little bit, we'll do that. Uh, and then we'll come back to these questions. So we're going to see if we can, if the mic will pick everything up. So don't worry, you all look right on camera, but we're going to try to just include include our online friends in the discussion. So uh, you can all just wave at them and then, yeah, we can. <laughs> Scott's like, it is too early to wave at people. <laughs> uh, okay, so just open floor, no pressure, because like I said, I threw a lot at you, and then, you know, this is kind of a personal subject, but in general, thoughts on what we've discussed, or <laughs> not really as much discussion as Mariam's talking, but <laughs> what are your thoughts so far? Uh, and then also just, you know, what do you think about a relationship with Jesus? Yes, sir? Usually a loud mouth in places, so I'll go. Um, Bring it. <laughs> uh, I was raised Lutheran, so, and I've been in the church my entire life. Um, so most of this is very, very heard by me before. Yeah. But with the personal relationship with Jesus, I. For me, it's always been, I feel like, a struggle. And it, I think it's a struggle to overcome myself because daily, hourly, sometimes it's like, yes, yes, like you were saying, yes, I want to do what you want me to do. Let's do that. I don't want to do that. Yeah. that that's hard. That sucks. Or, ooh, shiny. And off right. I go. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so um, me and church and all that has always been a thing of me trying to work closer to that relationship and to improve that relationship with Jesus it's hard and it's, it's been a it's always been a struggle for me yeah I hear that I don't know if anybody else can relate to 